So I'm talking about this thing which is inherent in the art world, which is variability and innovation. And those two things go hand in hand. And I want to talk about today where that meets and where that clashes with the upstream culture, this culture which has produced Linux, this um, fantastic operating system that we all build upon, and how we need to make those two things evolve together. So I want to start by uh, taking us back a year to a bad day in Linus's life. And this is a, I'm including here a quote from a very famous kernel uh, developer who's here with us today. And that developer wrote, um, instead of going home and, and having a beer, you know, just wrapping up and having a beer, at 6.31 p.m. he decided to write back to Linus and said, but x86 is peanuts, really. And this spurred a lot of lively conversation, and it's one of the, one of the most memorable threads that's happened since Linaro started. But I want to take a look at that statement there and understand from where Nico is coming there. So is x86 really peanuts? So from one perspective, it's certainly not peanuts if you look at what sort of functionality is included in the upstream kernel. There is a lot of functionality in there. Um, apart from this uh, bugbear ACPI, you have all the different virtualization platforms. So you have user mode Linux, uh, KVM, Zen, um, VDSO, full power management enablement. Um, a lot of tools that are basically for debugging, profiling, and tracing what's going on. And in the x86 tree, in a single tree, not, not spread across multiple trees, but in a single tree, you support um, everything from the venerable i386 all the way to the Medfield SOCs. So that's sort of 25 years of hardware supported in the same basic um, architecture in the kernel. And it used to be even that x86-64 and x86 were separate, and that merge was also done, and I'll also talk about that in the future. So from the functionality perspective, x86 is certainly not peanuts. Now, why does Nico say that? The reason is because architecturally, x86 is pretty boring. If you look at an x86 um, CPU and x86 computers out there, um, everything about them is pretty much standardized. There's not a lot of variability. Actually, some people would argue there's not any variability. It's the same boot interface, the same buses. Um, they have a, a standard way of describing what the platform, look, what the hardware platform looks like. Um, even the chipsets um, are standardized there. And it doesn't have any of this Biendian craziness which ARM has. And so in a lot of ways, x86 is very simple if you look at it. There's not a lot of variability, and that's why they can support all these different platforms in the same kernel tree. So even the x86 SOCs are pretty similar to each other. Now, contrast this with the ARM side. So we can't really talk about an ARM platform, and um, David usually says that we do have some standards, but they're pretty low. <laughs> the, the, the better way of saying that is to just make it clear that ARM doesn't specify complete systems. And it's not, it's not actually in the value proposition for ARM to, to, to determine exactly how the platform is supposed to work from one end to the other. And instead, the business model for ARM um, lets the chip makers, and to an extent the OEMs, decide what that complete system looks like. And so there's a lot more um, variability because the ecosystem provides um, each of the participants in, in, that, in the hardware ecosystem there the, the functionality or the, the I guess, the resources to make that, that, that variability happen. So the ecosystem and the business model lead to inherent variation. Now, this variation thing is tricky, right? Because it's a spectrum. If you look at it from one end, if a single SOC vendor, a single company, produces every single SOC family completely differently one from the other, and there are some that do that, then it's very hard for you to be able to actually support that in software because if the hardware changes all the time, then every single time you're doing enablement, the platform is completely different. All the devices are different, the way they're wired up are different, and you don't really get that continuity or the benefit of that continuity in software. But on the other, on the other side, if everything is the same, then what you end up with is a trivial platform. And trivial platforms are bad because they stifle innovation. If there's only one way of producing a platform, then, well, there's not a lot of change they can do in the hardware. So the, the problem is that where do you decide along the continuum what is wanton, useless variation and what is actually competitive benefit? And so it's a matter of opinion where that line actually falls. And we know, as, as all the SOC vendors here and the OEMs, that 
Establishing a competitive advantage is not simple. There's a lot of companies out there that are producing good hardware, and so deciding where your variability, where you innovate, and where you do something standard is hard, and so you need to make that decision carefully. So let's go back to the original point. Why does Linux actually care about all this stuff? The reason he cares is because today, ARM is basically the majority of architectural, sorry, architectural code in the kernel. So if you look at 3.4, about 500,000 lines of code are ARM, and that's double the, the, the next um, platform in the kernel, and much bigger, probably three times the size of x86. So the question is, how did we get here? So it's not like Linux is, compla Linux is complaining that all oh, these ARM guys are doing all this crazy stuff, and they're not working with us. He's sort of complaining they're kind of working with us too much, or not in the way that, they want, that he wants. So how did we get here? So going back um, around, I don't know, eight years ago, so Nokia released in 2005 the Nokia 770. I have one of these. This is, I think, the first consumer device produced by a major OEM that runs Linux on ARM. And because of this release, and because of all the effort that Nokia put behind Linux, support for the platform which they used for the 770s, which in this case it was the OMAP one, and then they moved on um, to, to newer families as the products progressed. But support for that became a big deal. And it's pretty accurate to say that OEM interest in Linux is what really spurred um, this wave of upstreaming that happened. So let's look at it from the OEM's perspective. Upstreaming is something which we talked about since um, Linara started. And before Linara started, we started talking, a lot of people in the community have been talking about the benefits of upstreaming, why we need to be in tree, why this is important. So looking at it from the SOC vendor's perspective, it's usually hard to justify. If you look at it just from the SOC vendor's perspective, it's a cost. And it's a bit of an annoyance because you don't want to have to interact with this big software system which is changing all the time. You want to have something which is fairly controlled and you want to work towards something which performs well and is stable. So from the SOC vendor's perspective, if you just look at it from their perspective, it's hard to justify the effort. But upstreaming is not really for the SOC vendor. Upstreaming, the people that really benefit from upstreaming are the OEMs and their customers, their end users. Now let's look at it from the OEM's perspective. Why is upstreaming good? First, because it enables a really simple software enablement story. You pick up any operating system that's based on Linux, and you put that on the device, and it works. That's a great story. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to call up the SOC vendor to ask them for special permission for the software or anything else. You take the software, you put it on the device, and you're ready to start building a product. The next reason, which I think is really important and often ignored, why upstream benefits the OEMs, it's the long-term ability to upgrade. One thing which we found with SOC vendors have struggled with is the fact that because the kernel moves on relentlessly and because each platform chooses a different kernel baseline to, for, to release the products on, well, as an SOC vendor, you're always pedaling really hard to try and keep up. So Android comes up and actually the, the next Android version is on a kernel version which you're not ready for. What do you do? So all your SOC VSP enablement team has to run and port the software up there and they'll keep on doing that as new platforms come on. Now, that's a wrap. You don't want to be in that, in, that, in that space there because over time, nobody wants to do that work. And you'll have a lot of motivated engineers today, but in five years' time, after rebasing the same patches over and over again, they'll be looking for better jobs. So one thing which upstreaming does help with you there is that because upstream will carry your patches or carry your board support together with them, you get for free this long-term ability to upgrade and this stated holy grail um, on the Android side, which is to provide upgradability for devices, something which Apple actually gets really, really right, and something which we don't get right on the Linux side, is tied into this. Because everybody has to keep on redoing their board support, it's very hard for us to support upgrades across versions. The last thing, which is sort of a derivative of the two of there, is that upstream really enables something which helped consolidate Intel um, as a platform, and that is long tail innovation. So what do you want to have? You want to have a market of really interesting devices coming out all the time being produced based on those platforms there. Now, if each device vendor who's gonna go out and try and select an SOC has to go and talk to you about getting your software and figuring out how it works, and oh, the version doesn't match the operating system that they wanna use, then all of a sudden you're sort of killing their path to delivering the products. And you don't want that. You want it to be really easy for anybody to pick up your SOC 
and to build a product out of it. And so this is why upstreaming also benefits the OEMs. It's because it benefits OEMs that you won't even talk to. You don't even know that you need to talk to. People that are building the next Android are out there today trying your SOC out and not figuring out where are the graphics drivers for this thing. God damn it, it doesn't fit with anything that I have. So just summarizing it or, or, or taking a different tack on that, um, a standard kernel in many ways can make up for the absence of a complete platform. So even though we don't have a complete platform on ARM, if you have a kernel which abstracts away a lot of the hardware variability and provides good functionality to the OEMs, and all the support is baked into it, well, then you have almost the same thing. It's almost as, as good as. Upstreaming, however, is kind of like eating healthy food. And you know, if eating unhealthy food killed us, there'd be nobody alive in Scotland anymore. So it takes time for us to, to really reap the benefits of this activity there. So, how did we get here? So, so why, how did we get to this problem where that we're actually annoying things about the, the rate of changes there? So basically, you know, everybody told the SOC vendors, you have to upstream your board support, you have to go out and do it. And so we asked for it and it happened. So all the SOC vendors, or at least the big important ones, and the software integrators got the message. And from 2008 onwards, there's a lot of effort to upstream. Now, if I do an analysis, a cold analysis of this functionally, it's kind of had mixed results. A lot of the platforms do have some support upstream, so it is true that you could, um, for 3.0, boot it on a lot of ARM platforms, but the support was flat, was partial at best. And what we want is way beyond that. We want you to be able to boot any kernel on any piece of hardware and for it to all work. That's, the, that's where we want to get to. But this effort did lead to a very important change. So this is a, I, I've done a graph here of basically the lines changed per architecture for every kernel um, from 2.6.0 on to 3.4. And I first want to get rid of the distractions here and then we'll look at what the, the, the core piece here. So let's just look at three of the, the three peaks there. So in 2.6.24, this is an interesting one just to illustrate this thing about platform consolidation. This big peak here is actually moving together i386 and x86.64 into a single architecture. So that's the first, that's this first bound. Spike over here. Um, the next one over here is when Nico decided to upstream um, Lockheed Kirkwood, and at the same time we did a big rev of DEF config. And so this is the first big peak on ARM, and this is around 2627 um, timeframe. Now 2635, which was actually the first release that came after Linar started we saw OE's um, def config patch, which went in and cleaned up a lot of the def configs there. And so this is another one of these big peaks there. And this is, this is just noise, really, in the changes here. This is not what you need to be paying attention to. What you need to be paying attention to is actually that this yellow area over here is the work that we've all collectively done to make ARM upstream well-supported. And if you look, from 2628 onwards, ARM is the majority of the changes that are happening in upstream architecture. And so from this perspective, ARM is the most important platform for Linux today. And this is a result of all this work here. So we are, to a large extent, victims of our own success. Now, one of the things that was discussed in this thread um, where Nico wrote this x86 is, is peanuts pearl is that Linux do the, doesn't like the div stats. And it's not exactly true. Linux actually enjoys his, his work and changing software is, is an integral part of that. So if you look at 3.4, just the raw diff stat there, it's 500,000 insertions um, in the three month period there. So what Linus is really concerned about is poor design. And poor design in a way is a matter of opinion, but Linus is, is concerned about poor design both on the hardware platform level, and so he complains about the lack of this fabled ARM platform, but he also complains about the way that we've implemented the software for it. Now, the truth is that the kernel wasn't really designed to accommodate SOC variation. Because the kernel was largely designed around x86, and all x86 platforms are pretty standardized, as we said, the kernel doesn't know how to handle all this level of variability there. But the answer here is not really to reject variability, it's to understand and plan for it. So let's take a look at what level of variability we have here. So this is a graph which shows um, the ARM platform and machine directories, and it counts the number of directories that are modified for each kernel release. So if you look here, over the last, I don't know, um, eight releases or so, we've modified over 60 directories for every release consistently. 
So what does this what, what does this say? That people are changing the ARM code there, and which they're changing it a lot. And if you take a step back and look, what does that mean? Inherently, it means we have a very healthy ecosystem. People are are touching the code. Healthy code is live code, code which gets changed. And so we have a very healthy ecosystem over there. Now, it's not completely healthy if you look at the sort of changes that are happening and the lack of abstractions we have, but it is healthy in the sense that a lot of people are worried about it and are chipping in to make it better. So let's summarize around that. So innovation versus maintenance, which is where I started here. Now our ecosystem, because of the business model, because of the companies that are here, there's a rich inherent diversity in it. And that diversity is our strength. This is what keeps ARM and the silicon vendors alive. Um, each company can develop their own approaches to how you do power, how you do um, improve performance, and the price point for it. And so that diversity there is definitely what keeps ARM in the driver's seat today. However, we should learn from upstream's design concerns. So Linus is right, but not exactly for the reasons he's pointing out. The reason he's right is because Unless you manage it, this innovation and variability is unsustainable. So we need to work to keep the platform healthy, and we need to do it all together. It doesn't make sense for, and I've never seen an SOC vendor actually produce upstream infrastructure, which was generic. It's very hard to do that. The only way to do it is to come together and to describe what the platforms have which is special, and then figure out what the middle ground is. So my, my point here is that we need good abstractions, and let's get together to build them. Now, I want to do an interlude here and just ask the audience here, have you ever submitted a patch to the Linux kernel? So I haven't, so I'm not going to raise my hand, but please do raise your hand if you ever have. But Paul has, apparently. I know Nico has, too. Okay. So I want to point out something which is often missed here. So let's, let's think of, put yourself in the seat of somebody who's reviewing a code change. What does the maintainer actually receive from somebody who's doing work? What he receives is something like this, a text file full of changes which look like this. Now, put yourself in, the, in their shoes, right? This guy is looking at this code change. He has no access to the same hardware that you have. He doesn't understand what the use case that you're working on is. And sure, there are exceptions. You may be sending the patch to somebody who has exactly the same hardware and who knows exactly what you're doing. But generally speaking, the people that are looking at your code don't know exactly what the environment that you're, you're, you're working on is, and they don't know exactly what you're trying to get to. So just one thing to, that, we have, that I want to really call out in the mind frame, which often people that are upstreaming code miss. Maintainability beats everything else. This is what the kernel maintainer actually cares about. So I want to tell you one interesting fact that for people that are new to this, they find it very unusual. Maintainers don't actually test your code. So you may make a change, and the maintainer will take it, but you can't expect them to actually run that code on a system. Even if they wanted to, they, could, they won't have the same hardware as you have, um, they won't be able to reproduce the same scenario as you do. So it's very hard, it's, it's rare actually the maintainer will test your code. So this approach to quality is very unusual, but it's also the truth. The maintainers very rarely will run your code on the same platform, the same situation that you are. The second factor is important is what really gets you in trouble is breaking x86. Now why is that? What's that? Right. <laughs> That's a very good point actually. So why does breaking x86 get you in trouble? It's because of this host platform issue. It's because nobody develops sitting down on our machine. And because everybody who, yes, well, everybody who's sitting down is working on basically on x86, um, what gets you in trouble is breaking the maintainer's computer. It's not really breaking the code which you're touching. If, if you break their computer, that's really what gets you in trouble. Paul? If you, if you get bonus points, you break x86, it changes all in the ARM device. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody's ma managed to do that so far. Give them time. <laughs> now, the fact number three, what, is maintain what do maintainers actually care about? The code needs to look good. This is what the guy is looking at. So what he's going to do is he's going to read the change, and the change needs to make sense. It has to be simple, self-contained, understandable. Those are the things that he actually cares about. He doesn't care if it works or not. And this is one thing which a lot of people get wrong, that they think about the code in the sense that this code that I'm doing has to fix a problem. From the maintainer's perspective, it doesn't have to fix a problem, but the code has to look good. It has to be something which is maintainable and which they're willing to live with forever. It's sort of getting married to every piece of code that people submit to you, right? that you have to be willing to live with that piece of code forever because you're going to be the one that's going to be maintaining it and forward porting it onwards. So anyway, 
Don't worry about the wrong things. Remember this, the maintainer is not going to test your code, or very rarely will he. He is going to run the code, however, on at least his development platform, and that's going to be x86. And what he's really going to care about is if the code looks sensible. That's what he cares about there. Now, there's a kernel upstreaming session um, at 10 a.m. Today, today, and well, I'll talk more about this in a second, but if you've never upstreamed before, you're curious about how to do it, or you want to get better at it, that's the session to go to. Anyway, so end of interview. So my pitch for this week is it's time we took wider ownership of the Linux software platform. So as ARM, as ARM SOC vendors, as OEMs, as ARM himself, we have to take wider ownership of the platform and actually make the platform work for us. If we let every other, other platforms decide for us, this kernel will never fit us. And so we need to raise our game and really pick up here and drive us to, to wh where we want it to get to. So what are the tools for us to get there? So first, when you're doing a new design, something which a lot of people here will be doing, looking at a new design, looking at a new architecture which is coming up, figure out what needs to change in the kernel to accommodate your new design. Don't work around the kernel. Figure out what should the kernel provide that will make your new design really easy to enable. Now, nobody else will do that work for you, not even in Linaro, because we may not even know what your platform is. If you're not a member and we don't look at your platform, we don't care about it. Now, nobody else will do it for you. What areas do you want to care about here that will help you take that ownership of the kernel that I'm, I'm pushing for? First one is enablement, because that's the majority of the work that we do on SOCs. But other areas, optimization, and then looking at the wider ecosystem that people that are using your products to actually deliver things to end users. And this week, Connect, this is a great place to start. We're going to talk about all those areas over there. So in terms of enablement, Think about upstreaming your platform code really early. You may not upstream it because of your product cycle. You may not upstream it, up, upstream it because of your deadlines. But you want to think about that early and figure out, is there something missing upstream which we need to provide to make your enablement easier there? Get it right the first time. So we've talked about device tree and we've implemented it over the last two years. Use device tree from the get-go. Don't work on a platform which has its own board files. Use device tree as the way to describe what the platform looks like. Use all the plumbing that we and others are working on. Pin control, regulators, common clock. If you go to any of the kernel sessions, you'll look at the plumbing that we're building, which you should be using in your SOC. Look at the wider power management frameworks. We need to evolve these because they don't fit ARM perfectly, but you need to use what's already upstream. You can't ignore this. Monday, so today, we're going to have basically back-to-back -back training sessions in Fountain. And Deepak, can you just raise your hand so people can know where you are? So follow Deepak to to Fountain if you care about this and knowing more about enablement and our plans around what we're doing in the kernel, how to use some of this infrastructure and what device tree means. So optimization, you should optimize. This is the right thing to do. It's what will keep the architecture healthy. It's what will drive better products to the market. But you need to remember the upstream context. So when you optimize, you have to be figuring out how much on a limb are you, how, how far from where the existing software code is are you? And how much do we need to change it to provide what you're doing? So one area in which we're going to look at optimization a lot this week is around power management. And Big Little Switcher and MP, just coping with that architectural change is something that we will put a lot of energy into. And if you care about that, this is the place to be. V8 and the future of the architecture there. So we know V8 will bring changes to the instruction sets and the basic ripple effect that that has. But people building V8 systems are not going to build just V7 systems that have 64 bits on them. They're going to go beyond that, thinking about what the wider changes in the platform need to be and taking advantage of this architectural break to really innovate there. So let's think about V8 and what the platforms are going to look like, and then let's look at the software support and tell us what is missing there to make it great. Look at system-wide performance. One of the big things that we've done in Lenaro is just looking at this zero copy for the GPU, the CPU, the multimedia accelerators. Look at system-wide performance. Don't just optimize in one space. Look at how the whole system behaves because the reason that we're in this situation today is because nobody actually took a look at the system and said, actually, what we need to be doing is sharing data across all these devices. That's one example of the things that you need to look at system-wide. In terms of code level optimization, there's a lot of sessions that are going to be discussing the, the Linaro toolchain, uh, both in terms of the compiler toolchain, but also profiling and debugging. So this is something that you should be using if you're not using it today, and take advantage of the sessions we have here for you to learn more about it. Neon in the kernel, and where else? So these are examples of things that we are going to do to better accelerate ARM in the future. Are there things that, are, that we should be thinking about that you're thinking about that we don't know? Last about the ecosystem. So, 
One of the things which is very unusual about ARM is that there's no standard way of booting a device. And there's a lot of reasons why we've come to here. But for us to grow as a platform, we need to go beyond that. So the lack of a boot architecture today really hampers ARM because it's one of the main stumbling blocks for an OEM is if you can't even figure out how to boot this device, then how do you actually get to the point where you can start testing it? So looking at this, looking at UEFI, ACPI, and other evil things, um, in terms of the ecosystem as well, let's look about this. How do we support upgrades? How do we support wider enablements? How do we do long-term support to the people that are shipping devices that are gonna be running for 20 years? How do they have something which they can run on it? Let's, in terms of the ecosystem, let's think about the platform which we're gonna be shipping on as well. Android is really important, and for mobile-focused um, SOCs, it's gonna be the majority of the volume they'll be shipping, but there's a lot more out there that we, we should and will be using, and we should be thinking about that. And in an ecosystem as well, let's think about validation and continuous integration. This, uh, this quality approach of does the patch look good doesn't always work. There's a lot of corner cases where changes go in and they break things because that's, it's, it's inherent. If, you don't, if you're not testing everything which goes in, then things will break eventually. So validation and continuous integration are things that we can do to really make this ecosystem better. All right, so finally I wanted to really welcome you uh, for making the time to come. People that have traveled from afar, people that have traveled from close by, this is really um, fantastic to have you with us. Um, just a reminder, Connect is not for innocent bystanders. I expect you all here to be committing the crimes together with us. You're all supposed to be here to make this thing better. Um, so if you go to a session, do speak up. Do make your points heard. We don't know about your platforms. We don't know about everything which is happening out there. So unless you tell us, there's no way that we can actually accommodate for it. Now, I love this event. I think this is the best event that I've gone to that's focused around open source ever. And I hope you will too. Thanks very much for coming.